You just brought something to mind to me. So I wanted to ask you about gut health. <laughs> Have you got another two hours? <laughs> exactly. So I'm just wondering if you can give me just a little taste. I can imagine that there is a ton of crossover um, in your field and gut health. Coming back to fiber. So we talked about restrictions on grains before. Fiber is a prebiotic for healthy microbiome. So if a person isn't getting enough, what's the impact on the microbiome going to be? Olivia has done a little bit of mm. investigation into microbiome. Yeah. Um, microbiome, I think, is a buzzword mm. in every condition, As it should let be. alone just <laughs> MS and an emerging space. So we're learning more and more every day. In MS, I think when we come to what do we promote or what do we suggest for people to establish a healthy gut microbiome, it's probably quite similar to the general population talking about things like fiber, prebiotics and probiotics, if that's safe as well. Um, through research that I have conducted, I've actually looked at the oral microbiome. So the gut microbiome would be the largest biome system in our mm -hmm. Um, GI tract. In, in our GI tract. The second to that would be the oral microbiome. And we've looked at that purely from the perspective of it's less invasive for patients to do some testing. And so we um, conducted a clinical trial with mouth, mouth swabs for people living with MS and matched that to healthy controls related to their sex and BMI. And we found some really awesome results. That's only one of, I think, three studies that have looked at the oral microbiome in the world, to my understanding. So it's a pretty groundbreaking research, which is under review. So hopefully that's published shortly. <laughs> and yeah, yeah we, we did find generally speaking though, um, a, a huge difference between healthy and matched controls with regards to the composition. So in microbiome world, we talk about diversity and abundance. So diversity is how many species might be living in that area or region. And then abundance, is there one species that is dominating that? Generally, we, we want a diverse microbiome and we don't want any one species that is overriding or, or being too abundant in that condition. And in multiple sclerosis, in our patients or our cohort living with MS, they had a, a less diverse um, abundance of oral species and they had certain species that were more abundant and actually not even detected in matched controls. So people that weren't living with MS, which we have found from research and taking learnings from other conditions like Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's, that a few of these species are actually directly linked through blood brain, blood, blood brain barrier function, getting tongue tied <laughs> and neuroinflammation. So, you know, I was going to say that because there is a study that came out recently that even talked about the brain having its own microbiome. It's interesting to think about what that microbiome might mean for the way that we think and feel and the ways that our brain ages and what types of, you know, implications that could have on, on life, especially when we think about some of these types of diseases that we're discussing here that also have neurological impacts. It's absolutely fascinating. Thinking about anything with a mucous membrane essentially having a microbiome because yeah. of the interaction with the external world, um, I think Ektrams last year was talking about the lung microbiome and then you start thinking about, well, the effects of smoking, of course, it all makes sense that that's a risk factor for multiple sclerosis. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, fascinating. It's, it's really fascinating. Um, the, the patients or the cohort that we sampled, they're on a range of DMTs as well. So a few of them had orals, some were infusion, infusions, some were injectables, and even the differences in that and how that's affecting composition of species that are present in the oral microbiome. I think watch this space. Absolutely. It's mm. a huge, huge area. And I think we're only at the surface of what we know. Yeah, I'm really excited about this. There are so many things that I could think of that I can't wait for the results to come out because I'm even thinking of composition versus uh, the rate of disease progression. I'm thinking about so many things like comorbidities, for instance, and I'm thinking about inflammation in general as well as a big deal. Yes. yes. Disease processes. So inflammation has an impact on requirements, nutritional requirements. Mm. So they tend to be higher when inflammation's present, also catabolic processes as well. So two disease processes that we know are happening in multiple sclerosis. Yeah. And you have these anti-inflammatory diets that people think about as options. And I'm wondering if any of the successful diets focus on anti-inflammatory foods. I suppose 
And I don't, I haven't looked at this closely, but there's probably a correlation or a bit of an association mm. between anti-inflammatory foods and an eating pattern like the Mediterranean eating yeah. diet. So it, it, it's probably a fairly loose link yeah. between those two. And even though we package one diet in a particular way, it's actually loosely related to another one that actually has a lot of evidence behind it in MS. And certainly when it comes to a Mediterranean approach, it's very close to the dietary guidelines. It's, it's a safe one to start with because it's not very restrictive and it encourages those healthy foods that we have evidence for having positive effects in the general population and in people with MS.